This program was made possible by a grant from the National Endowment for the Humanities. that you can't imagine. I dreamed about just growing up and being married and having a white house with a white fence and staying in it and cooking. And I'm sure that came from my Dick and Jane reader. In high school, um, I decided I really wanted to be a secretary because I'd seen one someplace, maybe in a magazine, and they, they wore church clothes every day and they didn't have to chop cotton or they didn't have to pick cotton. They didn't have to be in the hot sun. They sat in a nice office, and I saw pictures of them talking on telephones, and I thought that was an excellent job to have. It would be an excellent way to spend your life uh, if you didn't have the White House and the picket fence and all of that stuff. And I worked for white folks every day. We'd leave the school, come home, change clothes, go to the white folks' place. So we'd be around their kids, we'd get to fighting with them, get in arguments about civil rights, get in arguments about black and white issues, and we'd fight. I mean, we'd literally bloody up fight. I mean, it, it was anger, serious anger. I don't remember fear, but my family, I think, was trying to express fear to us about it, you know, and to be careful. And I remember that my sister, who was very fat at the time, Mama had tried to get her to sweep under the bed with the broom, and she'd always say, Mama, I cannot get down on my knees and get under that bed because I'm too fat. Well, one night, the police came in front of our house. They let the dogs bark all night long, just about, and Jean got down and got under the bed. And Mama said to me, girl, Hadn't that old girl that room since she already under the bed, you know? So it wasn't all dark. It was some light moments, too. Woke up this morning with my mind. A generation ago, Mississippi was a state like no other. Its blacks were free in name only, second-class citizens in a system unchanged since the turn of the century. Most lived without hope, but a few fought back. And others, black and white, joined with them. They were young, with no political power or experience. Within four short years, they would lead their ragtag political army to the seat of national power. In the end, Mississippi and our country would never be the same, and neither would they. started chopping cotton, I think, when I was about six or seven. And basically, I was very happy. I mean, I didn't know that we were poor, because um, uh, everybody I knew, except the white folks, which we all knew lived differently, lived the same way we did. You know, we, I, I thought we were fine. My father was unable to read and write. He'd never gone to school. He was convinced that education was the only way black people had to get out of anything they were in. The straw boss, the agent, the guy who was hired to run the operation, like a business manager, was opposed to us going to school when there was work to be done. Um, 
And he had a rule. He would go around and say, these kids are too big to be in school anyway, and they need to be in the field. And my father was so adamant about going to school until he would walk us to the bus stop with his gun every morning. Like it or not, this is a European civilization, a white man civilization. And uh, it, uh, it, it should remain that there were the Negroes considered to be more or less guests. You knew you couldn't look white women, look at them in the eye without getting in trouble. Because you could be lynched for eye rape, which was really something that people believed in, that you were looking at a woman in a way that uh, indicated you had um, bad intentions toward her. Well, we have, we have in, in Greenwood, I think we have wonderful relations with our colored people. It has been demonstrated through the years in all the businesses, type of businesses. The colored people are very happy, extremely happy in, in Mississippi. And I think they feel just as warmly toward us. That's fact. Do you know anybody that disagrees with that? I went to a babysit for, for this white family, and uh, the white woman called me upstairs. I went on upstairs in a hurry so as not to keep the white woman waiting. She said, Mr. Lawrence wants to see you. And I looked in the bed. Mr. Lawrence was laying there among the bed clothes. They were so silky. And uh, I said, uh, yes, sir, Mr. Lawrence, what you want with me? And he immediately pulled me down into the bed and had intercourse with me. It was on, I was 11 years old that day. It was my birthday. It was no reason for us to run and tell our mother or our father because they couldn't do anything about it but get killed if they said something about it so many times. Girls, we girls would talk in the bathroom about it. You know, never telling our parents, but it, it happened very, very frequently. But after I was raped at 11, I started having men right and left, you know. So uh, I, was, I was easy, <laughs> and I walked sassy, and uh, I would cuss. I could out cuss a longshoreman. And I hated it. I hated it. I, I had all kind of fantasies about it. I was fascinated by people like David and Goliath stories. When I do these are my favorite biblical characters, the cats who kick folks' butt. You know, I liked Moses drowning everybody in the Red Sea. I used to go in the woods. I used to go in the back woods and preach and scream, fight them run into bushes and hit trees and pretend they was white folk. So you learn how to, how to negotiate your life with white folks. And I guess you also learn uh, the fear associated with them of, uh, of how much power they actually held over you, how, how they could determine whether you continue to live uh, or whether you died. The civil rights movement changed forever the old relationship between blacks and whites. It started in the 50s and gathered new momentum in 1960, when black college students began staging sit-ins and freedom rides. Their dramatic confrontations at segregated lunch counters and bus stations stunned the nation and galvanized blacks across the South. I was really excited about that. I would run home every, every evening and listen to it and, 
and every weekend when the newspapers came, we would read about it in the newspapers, and um, it was people saying, we aren't taking this stuff anymore, who stood right up and looked them in the eye in a way that I had never seen anybody do white folks. These young people were willing to take risks. They cared enough about what they thought was important, what was necessary to be willing to do something about it. And that is what attracted me. That is what attracted me, because I was always out there trying to do something about something, but the support system was never there. There was such a, an enormous feeling of pride that we all felt in their activity and their action. It just kind of radiated all over. It gave you almost chills to see people actually hitting away at, at the system of segregation that existed for so long. And it was young people that were a lot like ourselves, and they looked so magnificent. I mean, both the men and the women. And they were so nicely dressed, and, and that was a part of it. I mean, they were all dressed up, and they just gave you a, a, just an overwhelming sense of pride and accomplishment. I became aware, as we all were, that the Freedom Rides started. The buses were going south, and they refused to segregate at the southern borders where the law would kick into place. That is, if you went from Tennessee to Mississippi, you suddenly had to go to the back of the bus. Well, the Freedom buses were going down to break the segregated South. But I don't know, they Freedom Riders to the bus stop in Jackson and they get off. And they go in the white side and I'm looking and... Here, for once in my life, my fantasies were being played out in real life for me. I had always wanted to be in a position where I could fight the white man and win. These people were winners. I'm with them. If this was young people, that was challenging all this. And it was ordinary people that were challenging all this. And uh, it was like, it was the call. <laughs> it was the first time I really heard the call, uh, which is what it was. The students formed their own integrated organization called SNCC, their symbol black and white hands joined together. The Student Nonviolent Coordinating Committee attracted young people from around the country including a young math teacher from New York City, Bob Moses. Moses had grown up in the Harlem projects, then attended all-white Hamilton College. The sit-ins, when they broke out, just grabbed me the pictures of the Southern students. And what I became aware of looking at them was that they looked how I felt. And I really responded immediately to that. On a tour through the South, Moses met with leaders of Mississippi's underground civil rights network, men like the NAACP's Amzie Moore and Earl Steptoe. Moore wanted to take advantage of the new student energy, and he persuaded Moses to head up SNCC's first voting rights project in Macomb, Mississippi. There was a pull to go south. Then I discover SNCC. I was traveling by bus, and a couple of youngsters escorted me to the bus station, and they were looking to see, uh, now, where is this representative of SNCC going to sit on the bus, you know? So I sat on the front. It wasn't a long ride, and there was no one else <laughs> on the bus, you know? So there was never any confrontation. The rumors were going around that there were some of these freedom riders who were invading, you know, the town. And these people said they're the same people who done beat up the white folks down there in Nashville and and made them submit to an integrated lunch counter setup. And they're the same folks who've been working on the freedom ride. They're the same folks who worked with Martin and the, and the boycotts. They're the same folks who had the sit-ins in Greensboro, North Carolina. And, we're here to make a change in Mississippi. So I said, God damn, this is it. A sister at church said Martin Luther King's brother was in Macomb. And so we hits the road, and somewhere in that night, we decided to go the next day to look for Martin Luther King's brother, which turns out to be Bob Moses. Moore convinced Moses that the only way to crack Mississippi was through the vote. 
The state had half a million blacks, but would not allow them to register. A voting campaign could turn the country's attention to this injustice and pull the federal government into their fight. Now, this strategy was explained to the feds, to the Kennedy boys. They bought into that. Because the, the Justice Department believed that if you could break the caste system in voting and that there was open and free voting by all people, that that was the quickest and best way to break the entire caste system. When these boys would come to town, we, we'd sit and talk like we sit and talking here. When John Doe would come to town, we'd sit and talk like this. So as we would talk about this stuff within our midst, there was the understanding that we were all working on the same agenda. We want you to come down to the courthouse tomorrow. What? We're having a Freedom Day for registration. Okay. We want you to come down tomorrow and register. Now, y'all ain't going to march. I can't march. No, man, we're not going to march. we just going to go down to the courthouse. Because I ain't able. Yes, man, we understand. See, the strategy was you'd go out and talk to people about voter registration, bring them to the class, teach them how to interpret the Constitution, take them to the registrar's office the next day. And I really think that this is something that I could do the rest of my life. It would still be something here to be done in this area. Bob's focus was to try to just hit all these little towns around Macomb. Tallertown, Amit, Magnolia. I think we ended up in Brookhaven knocking on doors and trying to get people to register to vote. I don't remember a break from that day. For me, I think that was a river of no return. A great change is at hand. And our task, our obligation, is to make that revolution, that change, peaceful and constructive for all. Those who do nothing are inviting shame as well as violence. Those who act boldly are recognizing right as well as reality. Friends, I'm a Mississippi segregationist, and I am proud of it. In 1960, the Democratic Party became a house divided. John Kennedy occupied the White House. But Democrats, called Dixiecrats, ruled the South and resisted any attempts at change. Our forefathers did not intend to share this country with the Japanese or with the Eskimo or with the Negro as equals because civilization and savagery can never be equal. In Mississippi, Segregation was written into the bylaws of the state's Democratic Party, and it was carried out by an official alliance of lawmakers, police forces, and white citizens' councils. The Magnolia State would be the battleground for the South's last stand. From the governor, through the legislature, through the judiciary, down through the sheriffs and all the counties and the highway patrolmen, uh, the whole state was organized to promote and enforce racism, right? It was a kind of little South African enclave within the United States. We have had experience in the past with Negro political domination. It was known as the Reconstruction. There are some who call this present attempt to build up political power through the mass registration of unqualified Negro voters, the second reconstruction. They were very strict on that voter registration question. It was like, y'all ain't gonna register to vote, period. No, Jennings, you didn't pass it. You see there, you didn't fill out, but just look there, you just filled out that part, and look, you didn't write anything in there. You didn't pass it. You have to fill it out complete before you pass it. A failed man told me I was disqualified to register. My son, four years in college, and uh, he's the secretary of the NAACP, and he didn't pay. Well, nobody asked me any question except how old I was, and didn't ask any of interpretation of anything. And I said, well, I, I can't answer that. And then he laughed. And he says, well, this is the question that we give to some, uh, meaning that this was the question that they give to many of the Negroes, a question that they knew that they couldn't answer. SNCC joined with other civil rights groups like CORE and the NAACP to form COFO, the Council of Federated Organizations. Word of their efforts spread quickly through the surrounding counties, and local whites responded, 
Mississippi Star. Well, you can count them one by one. It could be your son. Count them two by two. It could be me or you. Count them three by three. Southwest Mississippi was peculiar even for that area because it was like you were back in the 17th century. Uh, it was very rural. It was isolated. And it was it was mean country. Several of us were actually beaten, and I was arrested also in connection with taking people to the registrar's office. Less than three months after Moses' arrival, a white state legislator named E. H. Hurst drew his revolver on a black man involved in the voter registration campaign. Herbert Lee, member of the NAACP, farmer and father of nine, was killed by a bullet to the head. Hearst claimed self-defense and was acquitted. Herbert Lee was one of the first people to go down and register to vote in Emmett County that Bob had taken down. Hearst and Lee knew each other and played together uh, when they were young. Even into their adult life, had helped each other, but Hearst was deeply affected by Lee's involvement in this kind of political activity. And he felt that it was within his purveyance to actually to assassinate Lee. We have walked through the shadows of death. We took it upon ourselves to go out nightly searching for people who uh, had witnessed the killing. It was really uh, very scary. You were afraid of every headlight that came up either behind you or past you. I mean, it was terrible, but it, we, we looked to see what jurisdiction we said, tried to have it. We had an FBI investigation. We never were able to make a criminal case out of that. That was our first encounter with this, and in many ways I was directly involved and took, felt personal responsibility. Well, well the, the problem there is that many said I had to come to grips with that problem a long time ago um, in terms of my own self. And there's a real moral question in terms of involvement of other people. Um, one way is that to, to be very careful about telling people about the risks involved so that there is no, so that they have their own decision to make as to whether they're willing to risk that, that kind of danger. And, and the question of personal fear just has to be constantly fought. I mean, it's just something that, that's an inside question. Uh, to which there's no easy answer. And I don't know if there's any answer at all. Yeah. And I remember Bob just devastated by what had happened. By this time, Bob is my, you know, he's my little Jesus, you know what I'm saying? And, and I'm angry. I mean, see him sad was like, you know, that was enough for me to go find the cat that killed Herbert Lee myself, you know. Herbert Lee sort of symbolized signing over in blood Right, to the struggle so that uh, it was clear now, well, they will have to kill us to get us out of here. COFO set out to organize the rest of the state. This was something that we had not had. We had not really thought about it a lot. Certainly, I had not. It was just something you expected never to participate in. And all of a sudden, whatever had been going on in the rest of the world was coming to Mississippi, and we were going to be part of it. We had heard about people who had been beaten. We would known about the folks who had been killed for trying to exercise this privilege. When they got to Shelby, we were ready. We were just saying, tell us what to do and where to go. Get your rights, Jack, and don't be a talk no more, no more, no more, no more. Get your rights, Jack, and don't be a talk no more. Get your we go and go to the church and we make up the flyers and pass them out and people come to church and we talk and 
Somebody come tell us we got to get out of town. We get on out of town, go to the next town. And we were eagerly anticipating the folks coming to bring freedom to Mississippi. We load up in the car, and we get over there early in the morning, we stop at this big fat preacher's house, and we tell him what we were there for, and he's so excited. And his wife starts bringing out the sausage and the biscuits and the molasses and the milk, and every time we empty the table, she bring out some more, and we just eat ourselves to death. I heard that some outside agitators had come to town to stir up trouble between the whites and the colors and that they weren't going to have anything to do with them. I immediately started looking for them because if they were new men in town, I wanted to turn a trick with them. I figured maybe they'd have some money. I was trying to walk behind them and talk, hey there, hey you. You know, he wasn't studying about me and all he was interested in is getting me into the office to work. So when he opened the door to go inside, I looked inside and I saw Emma Bell, uh, who's a legend in the civil rights movement. I saw her sitting at a typewriter typing. And I had never seen a black woman that could type like this woman could type. You know, she was typing, she wasn't even looking down at the paper. So I said to myself, oh, she's, she's typing a whole lot of P's and Q's. She don't know what she's doing. And I went on inside the office. I was scared to death because Mama had told me uh, don't go down near that fooling with those folks because she had to live in this town. And I went on inside. The first thing I did once I got inside was to go look over Emma Bell's shoulder and see what she really was typing. She hadn't missed a word. The people had read in the state newspapers, you know, the regular media, that these people are communists, these people are etc. And the black community was about as afraid of them as anybody else, you know? My mother was dismayed. She was scared. She was disgusted. She would always uh, say to uh, my other sisters and brothers, well, this old girl, this child that I've had, she's the biggest fool in the world. She will run out there and get involved against the white folk. And she would always tell me, God, don't you bring none of them freedom riders here to my house. Not a single church would would, would uh, receive them. And so we opened St. John to them in Palmer's Crossing. We have been thinking that the white people kept us down. But they didn't. You know what did it? Our fear of a jailhouse kept us down. And we would quote from the Bible sometimes. We'd make a subject and a text just like the preacher would do it. You know, I remember my favorite sermon was Moses and his stick, and the stick was the vote. And then they completed that by asking for a show of hands of people who would be willing to go down to the courthouse tomorrow. I expected to see lots of hands go up. They didn't, so, you know, I raised mine, and uh, three men, bus drivers, school bus drivers, we were the ones who committed to going uh, to the courthouse. We went down uh, today, and by tonight, probably the bus drivers didn't have a job, certainly not later than the next day. All the bus drivers had been fired. One day I was up in North Bolivar County, out from Alligator, someplace on a plantation, and I went up to this white man and told him who I was and that I wanted to, if, to see if he had any objection to me talking to his people about registering to vote. And he was so nice. He said, no, I don't. And I was saying, oh, gee, this is going to be a piece of cake. And as I was walking away, he called to me and said, oh, by the way, when you finish registering to vote, don't bring them back here. Take them to your house. And that just stopped me cold because I was living in this condemned house myself that wasn't fit for people to be living in. I had no place. I had no job. You were asking people to challenge the system and traditions, and you had to be prepared for the responsibility of what happened to those folks when, when uh, they followed your instructions or listened to your pleadings or decided to join the movement with you on the spot, that you became responsible for the folks and their families and their welfare. The 
Delta was really a terrible sight during this period. I mean, you drive through those plantations. A plantation shack was really a one-room house falling down. That was the typical plantation shack with pieces of lumber and tin and stuff flying different directions and rotted porches and hanging doors and busted out windows. I mean, it was just terrible conditions that people would be living in. There was this wonderful woman on the bus there who sang every church song that you can imagine. And she really sort of lit up the bus with her spirit. Was her it was our mama in the movement. I mean, she was like, she represented that spirit for us. We were all children. And she was one of those who came forward and could tell us something. You can pray until you faint. But if you don't get up and try to do something, God is not going to put it in your lap. Fannie Lou Hamer had been a plantation timekeeper for 18 years. The day she registered to vote, she was fired and evicted. She joined SNCC as a full-time field secretary and became a powerful voice in the civil rights movement. We are not afraid. We are not afraid. Mrs. Hamer was an inspiration, I think, to everyone. She really represented what everyone was trying to organize for and struggle for, which was the transformation from the bottom of the society, the people who were sharecroppers living on those plantations, the promise of their being able to find their inner spirit and energy and put that to the service of a great social movement. And Mrs. Hamer, more than anyone else, came to symbolize that transformation. You see, we are human beings, and we are not stopping now till we get something that's better. We worked all these years for nothing. Women have gone to the field and worked from 10 to 12 hours for $3 a day. And I know what it is to suffer, and I know what it is to be hungry, and we are not going to stop. Even if I have to give my life, it will make it better for some child. So the excitement was, was, was this feeling of camaraderie, this knowing that you had somebody with you, that who was putting their life on the line just like you, and the belief that you were invincible, the belief that your cause was right. All of a sudden, for the first time in my life, I'm accepted. I'm part of the family, I'm part of the community, I'm treated as an equal, I'm treated as somebody who can be listened to, who have ideas, who have something to contribute. The movement was the beginning of me finding myself. I felt that the movement is the greatest thing I've ever seen. And I had a respect for people who start taking a stand and made me feel good. And people start looking at me. Well, I would feel so proud when I would go to Tougaloo and I slept in Ann Moody's room. You know, I would feel like, well, one day I'm going to be this great. I'm going to be in college, you know? I wanted to be like them. I wanted to sound like them. I wanted to understand what the movement was about. Ask you first what your intentions are. 
Chief Larry was looked on with all, because, simply because he was the chief of police and he had the last word on everything. And as usual, somebody pushed me forward. We would like to go on to the courthouse. I saw the look on his face. He is Isle of May's girl up here. He was just stunned. He didn't know what to do. And for the first time in my life, I saw indecision in Chief Larry's face, and that made me feel so proud. People start looking up into my face, into my eyes, say, that cat is sure enough tough, isn't it? I wasn't so tough, I was scared on every march, but I knew that I couldn't turn back. Something would, just wouldn't let me turn back. It was so beautiful to see people like Miss Lula Bell Johnson and uh, Miss McGee. They would be walking with pride, and their titties would be sticking out a whole long way in front of them. Mama said you could see their titties a block before you see them, but they'd be walking with such pride, and they'd be marching. And, and I remember myself trying to walk with that heavy step that they used. It looked like the earth would catch their feet and hold them. For the time that I learned Lift me up, lift me up, lift me up, lift me up, lift me way up, lift me on up, But these women would walk that walk, you know, and then when they when they get up and they see the, the human barricade of police, they start talking that talk and singing them songs and saying, I ain't scared of your jail because I want my freedom. I ain't going to let nobody turn me around. I'm going to keep on marching. Well, I found out that I could do it. I didn't think of it so much about dying, about how you're going to die. What the, the thing was, how you're going to live, right? Bob was so gentle and so kind. You couldn't ask for anybody better. He planned strategy. He got people out of jail. He calmed nerves. He soothed feelings. He made everybody feel like they had a part to play. I remember one time he pointed at me, he said, now, Ida, now you've been to jail before. You know how to go to jail. And I was glad to say, yes, Bob, I do know. I was glad to be used for something. Whereas the whole town, to me, was looking down his nose at me. The movement said to me, I was somebody. I was somebody, they said. The movement expose you to people who live differently. I expose you to ideas and interests and, and concerns, and for the first time, uh, introduce the possibility of a different life than just picking and shopping cotton. It unleashed yearnings uh, in me. I felt like I had come home. All of my life I had felt kind of odd. The way I thought, the way I felt, the things that I was willing to do, and then here were some people who talked my language, who apparently thought the way I did, and were willing to, willing to take risk. And I just felt like, ha, ah, finally. I went looking for Martin Luther King's brother to find my heroes in the movement. And in addition to that, I find also a family setting. I, I mean, this was a, was a turning point in my life. I was in heaven for a minute. In June of 1963, President Kennedy sent the Civil Rights Bill to Congress. It banned discrimination in public places. The South rose up to oppose it. The Civil Rights Bill gives the niggers special privilege and more rights than us white people contrary to the United States Constitution. Federal takeover of civil rights enforcement appeared imminent. Local whites, afraid of losing control, took matters into their own hands. 
I don't know, I don't know who set the bomb, but it was probably because of my activities in the movement. You know, uh, I don't know who threw the fire, but uh, there were some people who saw an explosion, like somebody had thrown a bomb into our house. And uh, my mama was in there, and she was in a wheelchair, you know, she couldn't walk. Well, mama died. Mama died. I remember she died in the Greenwood LaFora Hospital a few days later. And my, viv my most vivid memory of this time is the nurses, who I heard one of them uh, say, uh, I don't want to take care of that old stinking black woman. I was trying to keep as many licks off of that side as I could. Returning from a voter registration workshop, Fannie Lou Hamer and five other women were arrested in the whites-only section of a Mississippi bus station. And I was beat, I was beat, and I was screaming. Then one of the white men that was down, sitting down, he got up and started beating me in the head. But I couldn't keep from screaming because it was horrible. Three days later, the head of Mississippi's NAACP, Medgar Evers, was murdered in the driveway of his home, shot in the back with a high-powered rifle. It was like living in um, a foreign country where you were challenging the powers to be, and it was with no protections. There were no courts to concern themselves about our lives. The FBI was not down to protect us from uh, a crime, or uh, uh, violence. There were no law enforcement, local and state law enforcement officers that would protect us, so it was a very scary period. I understood clearly that unless we found ways to focus national attention on what was happening in Mississippi, that uh, they were going to wear us down, shoot us out, or whatever was necessary to stop us. They thought the Justice Department should do more. And uh, specifically, I told them that we could not protect them in Mississippi. Voter registration campaign was stalled. In the county where COFO had concentrated most of its efforts, less than 100 blacks could vote. Although President Lyndon Johnson would sign the Civil Rights Act into law, it did not protect black voting rights, but it did alienate the Dixiecrats. Time has come for Mississippi congressmen and senators to disassociate themselves from this party and join the conservative white voters of this state in supporting Republican electors for Barry Goldwater. The upcoming presidential election gave COFO the chance for a new strategy. At the Democratic National Convention, scheduled for the end of the summer, they could force a showdown with Mississippi's Dixiecrats and expose the state's injustice to the nation. But what we were after was how do you make a real political change in the state and our one chance of doing that was attacking the state where they were weak. And their weakest point politically was at the National Democratic Convention. To crack Mississippi, COFO needed to build national support fast. They decided to bring volunteers from across America into the state. We hope to, to send into Mississippi this summer upwards of 1,000 teachers, ministers, lawyers, and students from all around the country who will engage in what we're calling freedom schools, community center programs, voter registration activity, a program designed to open up Mississippi to the country. Well, I read in the paper just the other day Some 
700 college students from as far away as Boston and Southern California have come here to take part in a program called Freedom, Freedom for Mississippi. Marshall, what are your motives for going down to Mississippi this summer? Uh, reading the papers all last year, uh, talking with people and hearing about what was happening in Mississippi and in the South, shooting of Medgar Evers and, and other events uh, like that, generate such a feeling of, of outrage and injustice that you feel you must act. Part of the whole idea of the summer project was, was Bob's analysis that the law only covers certain people in America, and it doesn't cover southern blacks. It covers northern blacks a little bit, and it covers northern whites a whole lot. And so that if you want to bring the law to the south, you have to bring the people who the law covers to the south. The SNCC staff were smart, and a kind of smart that wasn't just from book learning, but was from having lived a certain kind of reality and then interpreting it and figuring out, well, what can you do about it and really solving problems. The people who organized the Mississippi Summer Project understood that if I went to Mississippi, my parents would care, my brothers and my sister would care, my grandparents would care, my aunts and uncles would care, the people in the community would care. And people did things because someone they knew or at least someone from their community was involved. If a young black from Mississippi were to get arrested, uh, put in jail, that'd be that. But if one of us got arrested or put in jail, well, it'd be Senator so-and-so on the phone and Congressman so-and-so on the phone and the New York Times calling. And, and that's what it meant to really bring the law to the South. And so there was a concern on the part of people that, what does that say to people that you have to have a white body to protect a, a black person. I mean, it, aren't human lives worth the same? So you raise in your mind, does America have any obligation to protect me? Like they protect um, one of the senator's sons who come down from Harvard or Yale. And, you know, that's, that's, a, that's an irony. But the reality was, was that I would be a statistic. Nigger lovers coming from the north, go home Yankees, you know, go home you Yankees, nigger lovers, you want your daughter to marry a nigger. Could you actually get black people who were the SNCC field secretaries working with these young white volunteers in a way in which everyone could survive, right, and could, again, could flourish? That was very good because you all got carried away, see? I mean, you were just supposed to yell and you started hitting us so you got off your frustrations, you know? Half of what happened at Oxford was the staff trying to figure out whether, in fact, they wanted this group of volunteers to go down. They were ambivalent about it. And the volunteers trying to size the staff up. And there, there was a big uh, dance taking place in which they were trying to decide whether this was going to work or not. Tuesday night, we saw a movie describing how the Negro was discriminated against in Mississippi with regard to voting. CBS reports, Mississippi on the 15th Amendment. As I started up the steps to the courthouse, I was a little afraid. The registrar, Mr. Lynn, was on his way out. I'm small, and he's an extra large man. A big, fat, white county registrar prevents Negroes from voting. We laughed because it was so completely foreign to us. Six of the staff members got up and walked out of the movie because it was so real to them. And some of the, the staff began to, to take offense to that because they didn't find that to be particularly funny. It marked a, an explosion point. It was a flash point for the staff finally to let out with all of their frustrations they've had and the hostilities they had towards the volunteers over the previous few days. What happened was quite profound because what we were dealing with was trying to sharpen the volunteers' sense of reality. The day before we were going to leave Oxford and go to Mississippi, the um, word came that uh, three civil rights workers had disappeared. 
James Cheney, Andrew Goodman, and Michael Schwerner went to Mississippi to help register Negroes as voters. It had been stressed at the training school they had just completed that the federal government could offer them little protection. Cheney a manhunt began for a summer volunteer and two veteran corps organizers, last seen in a rural Mississippi jail. The FBI discovered their empty car, but no sign of the man. What do you think of this? I believe them joke was planned and sitting off up in New York laughing at us Mississippi folk. You think it was a hoax then? Yeah, I think so. If they're dead, I feel like they asked for it. They came here looking for trouble. It was very clear to me that they were gone, that they were dead. And I knew that in my bones. And now the problem was, was how to convey that to the volunteers so that they could understand, so that they could have a choice about going in there or not going in, trying to, to know really what the conditions were that they had to face, that uh, before they got there, right, the die was cast, the stone was thrown, right, uh, it was very clear what the stakes were. We were all gathered in this big auditorium. I mean, there must have been about 300 of us there. And uh, Bob was up front speaking to us. Bob spoke looking at his feet. You know, this was just, this was, this was almost one of my most profound experiences of leadership. You know, this man stood up who was the head of the Mississippi Freedom Project, Summer Project, and he looked at his feet and kind of shuffled his feet and talked to us about how he felt. That job fell to me, right, of penetrating through that the kids were dead. Do whatever you want, you can't bring them back. Now you have a problem. You have got to reevaluate your going to Mississippi in the light of the knowledge that some of your who are already dead before you even get there. He said, uh, well, like of all of you in this room, um, probably some of you aren't going to survive the summer. And you shouldn't feel like you have to go. I mean, anybody should feel like they can just get up and walk out of here and not be thought as a coward or anything. It's just, but, you need to go, <laughs> too. And for him, it was like, I don't want to put you at risk this way, but I have to put you at risk. And he ended that standing up there, you know, in overalls and T-shirt and just looking at the floor, just saying, all I can say is I'll be there with you. And I would have gone anywhere. I would have done anything he asked me to do. I trusted him so much. It was incredibly powerful. And I left that meeting knowing not only was I going down to Mississippi, but that this would be the course for the rest of my life. And then there was just silence. And the whole place must have been silent for about, I don't know, five minutes. In the back of the room, a woman named Jean Wheeler stood up, and she just started singing. They say that freedom is a constant struggle. They say that freedom is a constant struggle. Oh, Lord, we struggled so long. We must be free. Pretty soon, everybody stood up and just marched out of the room behind Jean. The next day, we all went to Mississippi is a constant struggle they say that freedom is a constant struggle oh lord we've been struggling so long that we must be free we must be free
If we allow these invaders to succeed in that dastardly scheme, we will be guilty of a very costly error. The state would be invaded by 50,000 people, and they were always referred to as invaders. I'm totally convinced that they would slant the weather report if it preserved segregation and a southern way of life, whatever that was. <laughs> Red used to say the best way to get me up and going in the morning was just to pitch me the Jackson Daily News. I'd get so mad. <laughs> She'd be so mad before she got... <laughs> they, they literally armed themselves for the coming of the volunteers into the state that summer. That, that really sums it up. It was an arming, as though you were going to be invaded by the enemy. We were housed in, right in among the community, and they had a welcome for us, and uh, they put out a big spread, and uh, they put us in people's houses. Oh, it was great. I mean, they were so welcoming uh, to us and, and tried and, and made us feel secure, you know, uh, until we sort of eventually began sort of poking our heads out and beginning to, to do stuff. And the first night, there had been chiggers in the bed, which are little mite sides, you can't even see them, bugs. And they got into my legs, and I was just filled with chigger bites. <laughs> and the way you treat them is you have to put your legs in turpentine and, uh, or gasoline, and then they'll, they'll fall off. But just everything was a, a new experience. Then there was dealing with the whole white-black business about you know, people 40 years your senior calling you mister and giving you their seat. I still wasn't used to calling white people by their first name without saying miss. I mean, there it was, you know, there's like uh, 400 years of oppression right there. I, I could never uh, re let that go, that miss. It was too ingrained in me because remember, we had to even call white children miss and mister. I mean, talk about grappling things with, at a very personal level. I mean, that was like always the, the, the sort of thing. I mean, the system had been so institutionalized down to every personal encounter. Don't you ever give up that gun. That's all you got left to protect that little baby in that crib. Because these dirty devils will be in your home. That's what they want. They do not want equality. You know they don't want equality. They don't want something like you've got. They want what you've got, your women. The role of sex in a community, the, the weirdness was the white community's weirdness about it. I mean, it made them nutty. People were obsessed with this question of, of um, black male, white female sex that pervaded the project. It was, it was as if I wasn't a person. It was as if I was a white woman. That was my identity, and it was very oppressive. We're coming out of an environment where white women sitting down talking to you like uh, an equal was unheard of, you know, and let alone having sex with one. A lot of families were afraid to sit down at the table with the people that they were housing because they were white. Remember, we had never sat and eaten with white folk before. And we would, they would fix all the pork and all the pig feet and all that. And uh, people, and you know, and, and what was so funny is the white students who had never eaten anything, eaten chillings and all, were just sitting there eating like they were, like they were very, very happy to do so. And the outhouses that we had to use, well, I was, I was really surprised because I said, well, I know this white girl ain't going to go use this outhouse, <laughs> you know, like everybody else. And the girl went and used the outhouse like she was born to it, you know, and then that, that made us all sort of get, gang around them and gather around them. In Mississippi, Whites did not socialize with blacks. They did not worship in black churches, teach in black schools, or live in black homes. Northern whites were breaking all the rules, and Southern whites retaliated. Freedom Summer triggered a thousand arrests, 
35 shootings and church burnings, and 80 beatings. And any Southern whites who sympathized with the volunteers were singled out for their own form of punishment. There was a hardening of the political atmosphere. It was, there was no soft edges at all. It was just absolutely segregation and segregation and segregation forever. We decided on our own that our white volunteers would organize in the white community. It was just sort of like, uh, well, we should have a dialogue. Can't we talk about these things? Uh, how can we avoid confrontation? I mean, it was a very, sort of very moderate kind of exchange. So we sat around and talked about different things, and the house was surrounded by these cars, and the lights were uh, focused on the front door. And uh, we were just amazed that we just couldn't in the world. It, it, even then, I was so secure in my position in the community. I walked out there. I wanted the damn fools to see that it was all right. They were there with me. It just was beyond my conception that I could be in any danger in my own house. They were more shocked than anybody. They were totally shocked. They had no notion that that community in which they lived in and done business in and worked in would turn on them like that. And boy, it did. People wouldn't even speak to us on the street and would never call us on the phone anymore, never come to the house. And we, he lost his business. And he was asked to, to give up his uh, office. office. And they, these, uh, they, these things were hitting us just one right after the other, following this thing. And we were really sort of groggy. It just reinforced about like how closed the white community was at that point. To, to, so it was so uh, fearful and so under siege that uh, you know it would just expel its own like that. It was. I just don't know. I, the hurt. There's no way to describe the hurt. That, that really. When that a family didn't. splits, it's just. Not only that, but just the fact that that you, I had never been put down in my life. I'd never been rejected and over something that I felt that, that was just one right. And it was, um, it was very painful. But I mean, you also knew that you were tapping at something that was right at the heart of the whole way in which they thought about their culture and their world, uh, and we were threatening that. Okay, now we're holding our uh, precinct meeting for the Mississippi Freedom Democratic Party. COFO drafted the students into its overall strategy of challenging the Dixiecrats at the Democratic National Convention. The base for that attack was the Mississippi Freedom Democratic Party, an alternative to the state's all-white Democrats. By summer's end, the MFDP hoped to send its own delegation to Atlantic City as a rival to the state's regulars and demand to be seated in their place. It would be up to the National Party to choose between them. The self-styled Mississippi Freedom Democratic Party delegation represents no one but itself. And that we have no other way of doing it except through the Freedom Democratic Party. Since the state of Mississippi denied us the right to participate in the regular Democratic Party. I was the moderator of a panel there on civil liberties and uh, from the audience after the panelists had finished, the first question was, what do you think if uh, we bring a delegation of loyal Democrats from Mississippi to the convention and challenge the Paul Johnson regulars who will be all white and will be all anti-Johnson? So uh, I didn't have to hesitate. I said, I think it's a wonderful idea. I urge you to do it. Joe was particularly placed to be of, of a pivotal person in this because he was general counsel for uh, the United Auto Workers, Walter Ruther's organization. And then he was also heading up the 
delegation from D.C. So um, a few days later, uh, Bob comes into my office and say, you thought that was such a hell of a good idea. Will you be the lawyer for us? So I said yes, and that's how I got there. It was people taking on the system at the highest level, people taking on the folks who allowed people to be beaten to death and shot to death and lynched and, and worked without pay and living in ragged houses at the point where it could be dealt with. What we needed was some force within that party to galvanize it and say, look, don't go this way, go this way. What you need is not to pamper to uh, the white Southern racist political power base within the Democratic Party. What you need is to lay the foundation for building another base. The regular Democrats had caucuses, and so we had caucuses, precinct caucuses to elect delegates to the convention who would elect the delegates to go to Atlantic City. It was heartwarming to see these people who had not the slightest notion, including myself, of uh, what the political arena was like, really out there taking hold, setting up the uh, precinct meetings, setting up the county meetings, setting up the district meetings. They, like us, knew that every step was taking us a another step. So what Miss Hamer would have me do when I would go from door to door is to tell people that we, if we get stick together, then we can take the seats up there in Washington at the convention in Atlantic City. We can become great. So this was what this this is exactly what I would tell the people when I went to try to get them to come to the meetings. And I remember telling Miss Hamer, they gonna seat y'all, Miss Hamer, and she said, Oh, you think so? I, I said, Yes, ma'am. They gonna seat y'all. They had an objective in mind to uh, throw out the uh, Dixiecrats and throw out those people who were not loyal to the Democratic Party and to put themselves into those positions. I said if they told the story, which I knew, they would appeal to the consciousness of almost everybody who was a straight-thinking American citizen. What people were really waiting for is what is going to happen right at the end of this summer what is the response of the national democratic party going to be uh, is there going to be some attack on the power base of racism and of course what the students brought with them was the attention and the pressure of the country all right you uh can you tell us exactly what have you learned here what the press was a critical part of this struggle and they knew it and they knew that their telling the story was a big part of making the whole thing happen. The Mississippi summer was a media summer, and I recognized that. And I also recognized that I was a media person. That is to say, they, many of them sought me out, I think partly because uh, my father was in politics. And we recognized that we were powerful people in the sense that we'd come from families, and just being there brought our families with us. Just our appearance in the state with a declared social agenda was going to be a major uh, step all by itself. And the media circus that followed us was probably going to have the most major impact. Our first step would be to sign people up in the Freedom Democratic Party. Just that, put them at a certain level of risk. Then there was getting people to talk to you. So then they started using teams, whites and blacks, because I think that the reason they used the whites because blacks had a hard time saying no to white folk. We don't care what they were saying. So they used the uh, white women, and we would go in teams, and uh, we would try to get people to go vote. They would uh, say, yes, ma'am, I'm going. Yes, ma'am, I'm going. I'll be there tomorrow. And time they left, they'd go inside, shut the door, pull their curtains down, and say, I ain't going nowhere. And uh, the white girl, I can't understand what happened. All along, we'd be giggling behind our hand, us blacks, because we understood what had happened. What I remember about meeting white kids the first time who were movement kids, uh, 
young people in the movement was their demeanor, how they how they treated us, um, how they approached you, how they uh, were courteous and polite, and how they didn't talk down to you. Uh, and there was no fear associated in talking to them. There was no consciousness of your place with them. These students were all from colleges, you know, uh, major colleges across the United States, and they would help me get my language together, help me get my speech together. Uh, books was brought in by the truckloads from various points by people who understood that there were still homes in the Mississippi Delta where there were no books. And there were people eager to learn, I mean, who just soaked up stuff like sponges, you know? I taught what we called Negro history in the morning. That was my core class. And I didn't know this information myself. I went to one of the best liberal arts colleges in the country, and I did not know this information. And so there was a, this feeling, a great feeling of responsibility to go home, go back to the dormitory every night and to prepare. Because here were people that, that wanted it all. People had sent lots of books down, and the movement had started a library. And then I got my first introduction to a black person who were writing, Richard Wright. And as I read Richard Wright's book, I kept thinking, well, you mean black folk can actually write books? Because I had always been told blacks had done no great things. They hadn't done anything. We had nothing that we could be uh, proud of. We all looked into the things because it was part of the uh, overcoming the low self-esteem that we'd been made to feel about ourselves and sort of re-examine our practices and our behavior uh, from positions of strength. I always felt inferior to the Northern students. Personally, I thought they were smarter than we were. I thought, and they thought they were smarter than we were. Uh, I knew we knew more about Mississippi than they did, but they had the ability to, to, to carry out these long analysis and intellectual discussions about our environment and that seemed like foreign language to us. There were cultural tensions and leadership tensions and, I mean, just all the things that kind of go with this encounter of these very different, very different cultures and very different people. I grew up believing that the police were your friends. They uh, were the crossing guards who helped you cross the street and the place to call if you uh, ran into trouble. And I said, well, dear, I never, ever at any time thought the police was my friend because any time the police showed up in my community, it meant trouble. experience of arbitrary power being used against you was something that made me crazy. <laughs> the feeling of being able to depend on only yourself and those most immediately close to you, that the courts, the law, the whole system was uh, not there to defend you, but was in fact there to oppress you, I mean, to do you in. And there's no appeal to uh, rule of reason or law or anything like that. It's just, hey, that's, he's got the power. Ooh, that's a, uh, a real powerful emotional experience. You grow up in a safe middle-class community, you don't experience that. And there's a combination of a feeling of powerlessness and rage together that really um, makes you want to consider almost any means <laughs> of dealing with that uh, because it totally takes away your, your humanity and, and your dignity. Now, you know, I mean, for me, I could get on a plane and go back to Bakersfield. And so, I mean, I, I can never know what it is to live with that all my life. For me, it was just a taste. But that taste was one that, uh, well, it changed my life.
There was a time when many people in Mississippi thought that the disappearance of the three civil rights workers was a hoax. But now that their murdered bodies have been discovered, confirming what many refuse to believe, the voices of doubt are still. On August 12, 1964, the bodies of Goodman, Schwerner, and Cheney were found. Two days later, the Freedom Party began its convention. The state convention for the Freedom Democratic Party is now in session. I consider this an assemblage of people who, yes, have come through the wilderness of tears, who, yes, have come through the beating, the harassment, the brutalization, and I consider this a convention that speaks to the nation and speaks to the world. And its voice is saying that the day has come when racism must be banished from the political body politic of our country and people. I said, Politics is a tough game. The president has more strength than everybody else put together at his renomination convention. But we've got such a wonderful case against the other side. I told him they were going to win. Walking into the hall that Sunday morning and, and seeing all these people here and how pleased they were and how proud they were with themselves and each other was just one fantastic reward for all of the risk that had been taken up until that time. They knew that we're going to Atlantic City, you know, the sharecroppers, the maids, the, you know, the people, those who always looked elsewhere for their leadership, always looked to other people for their leadership. The MFDP was winning allies in the North. Nine Democratic delegations and 25 congressmen had decided to back its challenge. And then you can begin to see that maybe you are stepping onto the, onto the stage of history because you can begin to see this, this mammoth thing unfold. And it was much bigger than life. It was much bigger than any one of us. And it was through the efforts of all that it came together. Nothing but freedom over me, over me. We knew that we were, you know, the true representative of the people going. So I think everybody was up. I felt that our argument was strong enough and certainly valid. I had expectations that they were going to go up there and really give the Democratic Party fits. I think we thought anything could happen, that they might could go up and unseat people. We had the kind of confidence that the righteous have. Nothing could uh, happen except success. We took up a number of people who had never been out of the state of Mississippi in their lives. Some had never been out of the county that they grew up in. And here they were going north to represent their families and their friends and their party and their county and their precinct. And it was just a good feeling that here we are, we're on the threshold of bringing about change. Oh, freedom. Oh, freedom. Oh, freedom. it's so nice to have you back when you I 
was certain that the Democratic Party would cast out the Dixiecrats from Mississippi. I had real hopes that uh, we were on the verge of a breakthrough. To gain seats as Mississippi delegates to the convention, the MFDP would first need to testify before the Credentials Committee. The delegates carried with them evidence they had been shut out of the political system. As challengers, they set out to win the hearts and minds of the nation. From the boardwalk across from the convention center, there was the picture of Goodman, Cheney, and Schwerner. And that was sort of our encampment over there and our vigil that we were holding. We brought the freedom singers out, and we sung freedom songs, and we had the delegates out lobbying people on the boardwalk and lobbying other delegates and telling the story. And we did everything that we could possibly do to make the case for the Mississippi Freedom Democratic Party. We had the burnout Ford station wagon that Goodman, Chain, and Scherner ran. We got the, the bell from the church to burn. We had anticipated just appealing to the consciousness of America, and America would stand up and say, no more, Mississippi. With its special coverage of the activities leading to the opening of the Democratic National Convention, the Credentials Committee of the Democratic Convention has now begun to deal with the case of the Mississippi rival delegations, each of which... As Mississippi's Dixiecrats fought against seating the Freedom Delegates, the MFDP brought its story to national television. And what I want the Credentials Committee to hear is the terror which the regular party uses on the people of Mississippi, which is what the next witness will explain, Mrs. Fannie Lou Hamer. I remember being in back of the Credentials Committee uh, when Mrs. Hamer was testifying. It was the 31st of August in 1962 that 18 of us traveled 26 miles to the county courthouse in Indianola to try to register to become first-class citizens. After and that was a wonderful charging experience, right, to, to hear her deliver that testimony in front of all those people and to the whole country. Back to Indianola, where the bus driver was charged that day with driving a bus the wrong color. We will return to this scene in Atlantic City, but now we switch to the White House and NBC's Robert Goralski. Johnson saw her and blew his stack and he called a press conference to get her off the air. On this day, nine months ago. Here you had a story that the country really needed to hear. And what you have is the president of the United States thwarting the democratic process. That night, the networks really fixed Johnson's wagon. They replayed Fannie Lou Hamer in full. If the Freedom Democratic Party is not seated now, I question America. Is this America, the land of the free and the home of the brave, where we have to sleep with our telephones off of the hook because our lives be threatened daily because we want to live as decent human beings in America? Thank you. Boy, after that, it was just like we had it made. I'm proud to report to you as chairman of the Oregon delegation to this convention that at a meeting of the delegation this morning, we voted 20 to nothing to take this Mississippi issue to the floor of this convention. I mean, we were charged up that we were right, that what these folks were doing were wrong and immoral, and that uh, they were not playing by the rules, which, in fact, we'd been taught that the country was supposed to go by. And I don't think that if this issue gets to the floor of that convention, that they can possibly turn them down. I don't see how they possibly can do it if they really understand what's at stake. 
And we thought that once we presented ourselves in an organized fashion, where you would actually confront people with what they were doing that was wrong and, and remind them of what they were supposed to be doing, and they would simply stop doing what was wrong. This is America. I believe that any man should be able to rise as hard as Although Mississippi's Dixiecrats threatened to campaign for the Republican candidate, they held one advantage over the MFDP. President Johnson feared that seating a black delegation would lose him the entire Southern vote. The delegates of the Freedom Democratic Party, these people who have, in their convention in Jackson, Mississippi, termed themselves delegates. This is at the heart Johnson gave Hubert Humphrey the job of stopping the MFDP's bid. <laughs> well, so then Hubert Humphrey um, came to town and, uh, you know, Mr. Liberal, uh, and it turned out that he'd been sent in by Johnson as a hatchet man. Uh, my only interest in this is, uh, is an attempt to uh, try to bring about a reconciliation of views in the hopes to uh, keep our convention united. If Humphrey wanted to be the Democratic vice president nominee, then he would have to assist in bringing about a compromise because Lyndon did not want to alienate the Southern constituency, the Southern Dixiecrats. Johnson puts pressure on everybody. His pressure on me was very simple. He took the two people who probably would have had the most important part in my life at that moment, Hubert Humphrey, my uh, close political associate, and Walter Ruther, the head of UAW, the auto workers, of which I was the general counsel. That was my best client. So he's a genius at that. I think he must have studied at the foot of a famous British politician who said, every man has his price. All of a sudden, we started getting all these reports back that uh, people were having to change. And I remember very specifically a woman from the California delegation here who, who a black woman who broke down crying after she'd been visited by one of the Democratic powers that be, told that, well, her husband was up for a judgeship and he could just forget it if she voted for the Freedom Delegation. Well, welcome to the real world of Democratic politics. Tuesday afternoon was the real crux of the fight. It may not satisfy everybody. At the Credentials Committee meeting, Humphrey's right protege, Walter Mundale, offered a compromise solution approved by Johnson. At the same moment, away from the committee hearing, Humphrey requested a separate meeting with MFDP leaders. They wanted to meet with a few of us over at the hotel, and they began a discussion of what the administration was willing to propose to the delegation, which was essentially an offer for symbolic power. That wasn't what was anything that we could accept. We recommend that the convention adopt the following resolution. Walter Mondale kept saying it was now a fair compromise. When I finally got the floor, I said, look, we have made progress, but you've got to ask the Aaron Henry, the head of the delegation, what he thinks. At that moment, Aaron Henry and uh, Bob and all the others were with Ruther and Humphrey. I begged for a adjournment for a couple of hours. Vote, vote, vote. You could hear it like a legal lynching. I did everything I could to time. I tried to filibuster. Vote, vote, vote. I uh, made a motion that we uh, have a roll call. Vote, vote, vote. Hopeless. It was just decided to go ahead. If you've been out to the movies, here in a few seconds is what has happened so far in the convention this evening. The credentials committee, after a laborious work, came up with a compromise to uh, accept the uh, Mississippi delegation, the one that is mainly Negro, into the convention hall as honored guests and to let two of its members uh, cast votes as delegates at large, which is something that has never been heard of in a convention before. When we left the meeting, we found a phalanx of media people with cameras out in the hallway. And they were asking us, what did we feel about the compromise? And it gradually dawned on us that a decision had been reached uh, while we were actually discussing what the proposal would be. It was just complete you know, manipulation and, and cynicism. Do you feel uh, the acceptance of the compromise uh, was, a, was a victory at this point? 
Yes, I do. I think it was a victory for the forces of reason, and I think it was a victory for the Democratic Party. I think it was a victory for our country. The next day, then, we had the big meeting to discuss whether or not the delegation wanted to accept these two symbolic seats. They didn't just offer the delegation two seats at large. They offered the delegation two seats at large to be occupied by Aaron Henry and Ed King, the chairman of the delegation and the national committee man. And we spent, I don't know how long there, I know it was a long time, and people debated why we should and why we shouldn't. Many of the people who were coming in, we were thought were people who were going to be supportive and encourage us to fight not to accept the compromise. And what was happening is that these people were turning almost in your, in your, in your face. Almost every liberal spokesperson of the time came. I, mean, I sat in the church, there was a freedom delegation. Edith Green, Wayne Morris, Dr. King, uh, Walter Ruther, everybody came through that afternoon and made speeches recommending to the Freedom Delegation that they accept the compromise. They thought, you know, hey, this is something. It's better than nothing. But the fact of the matter was, it was nothing. And I think it was Ms. Hamel who said that we have come too far. We've worked too hard. We've suffered too much to come up here and not get anything but a, a crumb of bread. It was very clear to them that they were not being asked to share power. The question was called for, the vote was taken, and the answer was no, we won't accept it. And uh, that was a pretty sobering moment. The regular Mississippi Democrats also rejected the compromise. They refused to honor its call for a loyalty oath to the Democratic ticket and walked out of the convention. In a last attempt at symbolic recognition, MFDP members tried to fill the empty Mississippi seats. Well, I'm now in the middle of the Mississippi Freedom Democratic Party, or what's left of it. They say all 68 or 69 delegates are here. They are starting their march in the hall now. We decided, well, we're going to just take this thing the next step and uh, get seated on the floor anyway in protest against what was going on. One by one, the members of the Freedom Delegation from Mississippi are getting into the hall, and they're doing it by sending one in at a time to borrow credentials from those who are already in, carry them out in their pockets, give them to somebody else, and this process is being repeated, and presumably soon they will all be inside. Now, could you tell us, sir, did you walk in with a ticket? Yes, I had a ticket. I walked in. And where did you get what to with a ticket? that convention was, it was a huge classroom people were actually learning the democratic process right in the convention uh, it was a great sort of theater for empowerment when they are before the eyes of the world they are peaceful and loving and when they get back to mississippi it's nigga you can't come in here nigga you can't come in there nigga you get out all we want is a chance to be a part of america the last night, Johnson came out on the balcony across from our vigil of Goodman, Cheney, and Schwerner and tried to speak. And we tried to do everything we can to uh, let him know that his actions spoke louder than any words he could possibly say. And uh, we left Atlantic City with this uh, profound sense of betrayal. It undermined, for me, any faith in what, what is called the democratic process in this country. I mean, angry, wondering where do you go from here? What is the next step? If you've done everything, if the official electoral process doesn't work because blacks were excluded, and you've done everything you could with nonviolence and with um, organizing and with talking with people and being reasonable, and if that doesn't work, where do you go next? My hopes and dreams about being part of the National Democratic Party was dead. You lost a group of young black people who were looking to that political process as a legitimate process for entering into real power sharing. 
and then you also began to disillusion a whole generation of young white people. The Democratic Party and missed the chance to capture the attention and the energy of the generation that really set the tone for the 60s. They were afraid of young people. They were afraid of change. They were afraid of opening the doors to all the new ideas and fresh blood that wanted in. And it's like they had erected barriers and wanted to keep us out and to their own ultimate, um, uh, not just to their shame, but to their, to their undoing. What happened there in 64 symbolized the situation that we're in now. That is, the, the National Democratic Party and the political leadership of that time said, OK, um, there's room for these kind of people. Right? And it was the professional people within our group right, who were asked to become part and actually did become part of the Democratic Party. Uh, but on the other hand, they said, there isn't room for these people, right? The grassroots people, the sharecroppers, the common workers, the day workers, right? Uh, there's room for them as recipients of largesse, right? Uh, poverty programs and the like. There isn't room for them as participants in power sharing. A different scenario that could have uh, worked its way out would have been for empowering the Freedom Democratic Party, there would have been struggle, right? And vicious struggle, but not armed struggle. Right? Once it got into armed struggle and rioting and shooting and calling in the National Guard, then you got into a polarization which we are not out of yet. It's one of the great tragedies of this country. Economically, I think things are worse in, in many ways. I can take you to places where people still live on a very oppressive poverty. There are places like that still in this state. But the most significant thing I think that the movement gave to us was it removed people from fear. The freedom from fear of being dragged out of your house in the middle of the night for dare to want to be a part of the mainstream, or want to dream, or want to participate, or want to have that equal justice and equal pay for equal work that my father used to talk about. The generations since the movement have not been taught to stay in their place or to understand that there's a certain way to walk and, and uh, stand and look at and relate to white people. And I think that is, for whites and black, I think that is the most significant uh, contribution that it made to the people in this state. SNCC had won a major battle in Mississippi. One year after Atlantic City, Congress passed the Voting Rights Act, guaranteeing for the first time since Reconstruction federal supervision of elections. And so we walk in in 1961 with everything segregated, no voters. The first voter we take to register to vote is shot down and killed by no less than a representative of the state of Mississippi. But by 1965, four years later, the books were open for these people to be registered to vote. When I came back and we went to a fast food restaurant, and uh, somebody said, uh, let's go on in here. And all. I said, child, we can't go in here, can we? They said, yeah. And we went to the counter, and a white man was behind the counter. He said, may I help you, ma'am? I said, ma'am, well, thank you. kind of commitment that we were. Uh, it's hard to explain it I mean, to the whole community of humanity. Got 
this morning with my mind. August 7th, 1964, Ruleville, Mississippi, dear Ollie. Ollie, this is the greatest experience of my life. I wonder what in the hell I have been doing for the last 22 years before I came down here and really lived. Because the core values that were behind Mississippi summer actually still believe are broader than just 1964, broader than civil rights, but about remaking society. It was an incredible high to all of a sudden be with women and to hear women talk about uh, experiences that were similar to your own. And that's when it dawned on us that it was not private, it was not personal, it was political. And, you know, that was it. I started organizing women. You think about all the creative kinds of things that we did. When you look at uh, all the new organizations, you begin to see that things have changed. They're not what they what they used to be, and they're certainly not the best that they could be, but they have changed. To know that we were not alone, that we were uh, free, you might say. We almost felt like we could just... Yeah. And we quite literally didn't have to avoid certain subjects anymore. Mm. There we stood, and that to hell with you. I, th I think one reason why a lot of us who went through that experience are still at it in one way or another is because it gave us hope. In other words, we didn't experience being defeated. Yes, we had reverses. Yeah, the Democratic Convention, this, that, and the other. But we, we kept moving forward. And that's what keeps people hanging in there, uh, is hope. I'm, um, first of all, I'm Dr. and Deja Alame Holland. Don't nobody forget that. <laughs> That's the funniest thing, and it's the grandest and the glorious thing I've ever heard of. Just, just think, little cat from Greenwood could achieve that. So uh, that's, that's who I am, and I'm also a writer. I write plays. Um, I, I write plays that deals with the history of people here in Mississippi. We now have more elected officials in the state of Mississippi than we have in any other state in the union who are black or African Americans. If you go look at the registration book in Cleveland, you'll find that it's signed Lula Clara Warren Dorsey, the, and maybe even with a Mrs. because part of the um, registration thing also gave us our courtesy titles. We were no longer girl and boy. We were real people. Wherever you find one picture of one individual who was associated with this movement in Mississippi, you find somebody doing something different. All the way down to little people like me buying a sewing machine for a group of five ladies to make African clothes. That one sewing machine will employ 20 people in Africa. And that, to me, is still SNCC in Africa. How is a country which is increasingly pluralistic with a lot of nationalities, cultures, right, languages, right, which must all work together, how does it find something which can drive everybody towards the common good for everyone? 